Thank you, Cynthia and Professor Fukuyama. Welcome back to the World Affairs Council. It's a privilege to be introducing Frank Fukuyama to you today. I'm sure that um, many of you who are here remember when Frank Fukuyama met with us in early 2015 to discuss his highly acclaimed book, Political Order and Political Decay, From the Industrial Revolution to the Globalization of Democracy, uh, which had just been published shortly before that time. Well, our audience today is uh, overflowing even more than it was then, and that is indeed a, a tribute to our guest. Frank Fukuyama is an internationally recognized political scientist, uh, political economist, and author, perhaps most widely known for the book that he wrote in 1992, which was entitled The End of History and the Last Man. He has gone on to publish nine major books uh, and numerous essays and articles since then. And his work is always highly respected for its intellectual depth and intellectual honesty. Professor Fukuyama is now the Olivier Nomellini Senior Fellow and Mossbacher Director of the Center on Democracy, Development, and the Rule of Law at Stanford University's Freeman Spogli Institute for International Studies. Before that, uh, he taught at the Johns Hopkins University Paul H. Nitzes School of Advanced International Studies and at George Mason University. He served on the political planning staff at the State Department, and uh, earlier in his career, he worked at RAND. He earned his PhD in political science from Harvard. Because Professor Fukuyama has famously spent his career projecting and analyzing major global trends, uh, we asked him if he would return today and talk to us uh, about his views on what many believe is currently a trend toward nationalistic populism globally. And we are very honored and uh, delighted that he agreed to do so. Please join me in welcoming him. Uh, thank you very much, Judy. So it's a real uh, pleasure to be back uh, at the World Affairs Council. Um, I uh, have a house in Carmel, so I regard this as part of my neighborhood, and it's really glad to, I'm really glad to be able to see uh, all of you uh, at such a, a short remove. Um, in fact, I had forgotten the date when I had spoken here before, so that's more than, uh, it's like two and a half years, and a lot has happened in two and a half years. <laughs> Uh, so there's actually a lot, <laughs> I got a lot of new material. <laughs> uh, so I would say that actually the year 2016 was uh, something of a political uh, earthquake, but we need to put what happened last year, I think, into a broader uh, context. So the entire period from roughly the end of the Second World War up until, I would say, about the financial crisis in 2008, uh, was one of an expansion of what's called a liberal international order. This consists of two parts. There's a, an economic part, which has to do with a series of institutions that are meant to promote uh, the free movement of uh, trade, investment, people, ideas across international borders. Uh, and the second is political, uh, a series of uh, largely American-sponsored uh, <coughs> alliances, the NATO alliance, the uh, relationships with South Korea, Japan, uh, other countries around the world that has provided the political framework in which the economic institutions uh, could take root. <clears throat> the theory behind this I think is pretty clear if you've ever taken an international trade theory course. Everybody uh, gets richer in a system in which there are relatively few barriers to the movement of uh, economic goods and services across borders and the um, uh, the promise of that uh, world order, uh, I think, was largely fulfilled. So if you look at global economic output between 1970 uh, and the crisis in 2008, it roughly uh, quadrupled. Four times as much stuff uh, was produced by the world economy, and you had uh, you know, 
hundreds of millions of people rising out of poverty, not just in China, but in India, in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, uh, around the world. Uh, this was also a great period for the expansion of democracy. Uh, my, well, my, my former professor, uh, Samuel Huntington, referred to this as the third wave of democratization. So in the year 1970, there were only about 35 democracies in the world by the present. Uh, there's still, I mean, it depends on how you define democracy, but there are still about 110 to 115 electoral democracies out of the approximately 100 uh, 80 countries in the world today, so there was a big uh, expansion of that. But we are running into some rough seas, and in particular in politics, there's been what my colleague at Stanford, Larry Diamond, has labeled uh, a democratic recession. So the number of democracies expanded at a rather rapid rate uh, for this period, beginning in the early 1970s. It began to slow down, and it's gone into reverse uh, to some extent uh, since the mid-2000s. Uh, and beyond the numbers, uh, there have been some really big and important countries that have turned in a very negative direction, like Russia under Vladimir Putin, and of course, China was never a democracy, but it's continued to grow by some measures, purch uh, parity purchasing power, it's already the largest economy in the world, it's authoritarian, very self-confident, uh, and so forth. Uh, that's, however, not the subject today, uh, because I think what the last couple of years in particular have revealed is a different kind of threat to the future of democracy, which is um, contained in this word populist nationalism. So, of course, there have always been non-democracies like China that don't accept the basic uh, principles of democracy. Uh, they're still there. North Korea is still there. Uh, and the like. I think what is disturbing about recent trends is a threat that in a certain sense has risen from the interior of existing democracies uh, in which certain democratic institutions are used uh, to undermine uh, other aspects of the system that we call liberal democracy. And just to make clear who I'm talking about, uh, a lot of this centers on particular leaders, so I would single out Vladimir Putin in Russia, uh, Mr. Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, Viktor Orban uh, in Hungary. Um, I would even say Narendra Modi in India has certain characteristics that you know might put him in this category. There are ones you probably never heard of, like Alexander Vucic in president of Serbia. Um, uh, and then, uh, unfortunately, I think that our own president, Donald Trump, would fall into this uh, category. Uh, so it is a phenomenon that has been picking up speed uh, in the last few years, and that is the thing that we need to analyze further. So now, I th think the last time I was here, I gave you some definitions. I'm going to give you some more definitions. So I'm a political scientist. I'm sorry about that, but we need to be clear about what we're talking about. So first of all, what does it mean uh, in terms of institutions to say that the threat is coming from within a certain democratic tradition? Uh, I think that there are basically three institutional pillars of a modern liberal democracy that a well-functioning democracy has to have. So they have to have a state. Uh, a state is all about power. It's the ability to enforce laws domestically, defend yourself against external enemies, uh, and it really concentrates and uses power for those uh, purposes. Enforcement of the law, delivery of basic services, uh, and so forth. And furthermore, there's an important distinction between a traditional or a patrimonial state and a modern state because modern states are supposed to serve public interest. There's supposed to be a clear distinction between the public interest, which a public official uh, serves, and the private interest of those officials, that is to say, the enrichment of themselves and their uh, families. Uh, so in a modern state, uh, we worry a lot about corruption because what corruption is, is the mixing of public and private, where you use public resources uh, for private gain. And so the foundation of a modern democracy is a modern state uh, with a minimum uh, amount of, of corruption and the ability to deliver uh, services in uh, an uh, impartial manner. Second uh, component is the rule of law, which are rules that apply to everybody. Nobody is above 
uh, the law, so it applies to the most powerful people uh, in the political system and acts as an important constraint on power. Uh, and the third uh, pillar is democratic accountability, which is an attempt through free and fair elections to make sure that the political system doesn't just serve the interests of elites, uh, it also serves the interests of as large a part of the population uh, as possible. And so you've got this balance between power institution and then two institutions that try to constrain power. So that's a first set of um, that's the first set of definitions. Second set of definitions has to do with the nature of populism. So I understand on your board, you uh, here at the World Affairs Council, you had a little debate over this. Uh, among academics, I don't think there's a, a, a clear consensus on what populism is. Let me give you three ways of defining it, all three of which I think are uh, important in the present context. So one that's favored by economists would say that a populist favors uh, policies that are popular in the short run, but not so good in the long run, all right? Uh, so you want to win the next election, you do something that will get you that, those votes, but in the end it's going to lead to uh, really bad results. And that's definition one. Uh, the second definition is that populists tend to be very selective in their definition of who the people is. And so they say they're acting on behalf of the people, but it's not everybody, actually, not every citizen of the country. A lot of times they tend to define the people in ethnic or racial or other terms that reflect something other than simply citizenship uh, in a democratic uh, society. And then the final uh, element of the definition is that many populist movements are built around a cult of a single leader uh, where the leader has a direct um, connection with the people, uh, not mediated through institutions like legislatures or uh, local government or the like, but a direct connection between the leader uh, and the people. And everything really depends not on institutions, rules, uh, built up traditions. It really just depends on the personal virtues uh, uh, and power uh, of this one uh, individual. So if you say that those are three ways of defining populism, I think one thing you'd have to recognize is that not everybody that's called a populist actually shares necessarily the same characteristics. So for example, um, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela, uh, I think, uh, fits number one and number three. That is to say, he did a lot of short-term stuff that was really disastrous in the long run, and he um, uh, had a cult of, of personality, but he didn't. He had a pretty inclusive definition of who the Venezuelan uh, people are. Uh, in Europe, there's actually a distinction between populist parties in southern Europe, like Syriza in Greece and Podemos in uh, in um, Spain, which tend to be left-wing uh, parties that are not kind of based on race or ethnicity. Uh, they are fairly inclusive, but they do pursue policies that in economic terms are probably not uh, sustainable ones. And there is a certain degree of, of you know, personality-driven politics. Uh, the um, Northern Europeans have uh, something a little bit closer to, you know, to those characteristics with leaders like uh, Marine Le Pen in France or Hirt Wilders, although I must say, you know, Brexit, it's hard to put Brexit in this category because there's no leader. Uh, there's, no, there's no charismatic leader of that movement. Nigel Farage, who is the leader of UKIP, the U UK Independence Party, has actually now dropped out of politics to be a TV commentator. So, <laughs> I mean, go, go figure. Um, uh, I would point out uh, that our president, I think, actually qualifies in all three aspects of that definition in terms of short-term versus long-term. Uh, he's never explicitly limited the definition of who the American people are, but he has enough followers that are willing to make those distinctions to make you worried a little bit about what he actually uh, believes in those terms. And certainly, uh, if you think back to the Republican convention, uh, his acceptance speech uh, at that convention where he said, I alone understand your problems and I alone can fix them. I mean, that's classic cult of personality from 
you know, any number of populist movements in, uh, in other parts of the world. I think that from the standpoint of democratic practice, the big um, fear is that these kinds of leaders come out of a democratic tradition. They represent important parts of the electorate. They have democratic legitimacy, and they will use that legitimacy to undermine the first and second pillars. That is to say, they will undermine the rule of law, independence of courts, independence of institutions, uh, and then undermine the ability of a modern state to remain uncorrupt, effective, uh, and the like, because all of those other institutions tend to get in the way of you know, their own ambitions and agendas, and there's a kind of natural uh, tendency for them, because it so much depends on personality, to deinstitutionalize uh, the particular society uh, that they're living in. I don't think some people talk about a authoritarian dictator's handbook. There, I don't think there actually is a handbook that these guys all read. I think they're just basically interested in power. And in a modern liberal democracy, the institutions are organized to limit the power of the one leader that happens to be occupying you know, uh, the presidency or the prime ministership uh, or so forth. And there's a kind of natural dynamic in populism to erode those institutions because that gets in the way of the, uh, the agenda that brought them uh, to power. All right, so those are the definitions. Uh, I think we then need to think uh, about why we are in this period where you're getting leaders uh, of this sort. And I would say that there's three categories of explanation, economic, uh, political, and cultural. So begin with the political, uh, no, I'm sorry, well, let's begin with the economic ones, which are, I think, pretty familiar to everybody because they've been in the news a lot, right? So again, that trade theory course tells you that something like globalization, the reduction of trade barriers, investment, you know, movement of investment capital uh, across international borders is in the aggregate good. This was an accurate story. It did as, as, as promised. But the theory also tells you that not everybody is going to benefit, uh, that in particular low-skilled workers in uh, rich countries are uh, going to lose out relative to you know, higher-skilled workers uh, and in a certain sense, that is what has happened in this period of globalization. You've had this enormous Chinese, you know, East Asian, Indian middle class appear over the last generation. Uh, but a lot of that has come at, exp at the expense of uh, the working class in Europe, the United States, and the developed parts uh, of Asia. Uh, and some of the statistics uh, are really quite uh, astonishing. The, IMF uh, just published a study that pointed out that 50% of Americans have lower real incomes today than they did in 1980. Uh, I'm sorry, not 1980, than in, in 2000, so 17 years ago. You know, that's a really long period uh, to actually have declining uh, real incomes. Uh, and I think that one of the things that the election campaign uh, demonstrated to people that they may not have been aware of is that there's also been uh, an important social collapse within large parts of that community. So for example, um, the number of children growing up in single parent families, which has always been you know, one marker of, uh, of poverty, has risen to something like 60% of, uh, of all children in working class families where working class is defined not by occupation, but by level of education. So these are uh, households where the, you know, the parent has a high school uh, education or less. Uh, there's been this opioid um, drug epidemic. I mean, I do think that this is one of the benefits of the election is that now everybody is aware of this, but some of the statistics are actually quite shocking. shocking. Uh, the last year that there is um, statistics, which I think is 2015, something on the order of 60,000 Americans died of drug overdoses, which is more than the total number that were killed in traffic accidents in the United States. And one of the things that has happened, there's an article by Angus Deaton, uh, he's a Nobel uh, Prize winner in economics, and his wife, Ann Case, pointed out that uh, among uh, older white men, uh, the um, life expectancy has been dropping uh, in the United States over the past decade. 
uh, which is really amazing because it's been rising in every other rich country over that same period. And I think the single villain here is, uh, is this drug epidemic, uh, which because it takes place mostly in rural communities out of the glare of uh, a lot of the media spotlight, uh, has not been adequately uh, appreciated by uh, a lot of elites. And so this is part of it. I, I know if we get into a discussion of why Donald Trump won the American election, it gets very complicated, but it's very clear that that was an important factor. He won because of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. Uh, it's the flipping of those three states, traditionally democratic states, industrialized northern states, that won him the majority in the electoral college. And there, clearly, a lot of traditional democratic voters, working class, you know, union, unionized voters, uh, decided to vote Republican. This is a leakage that's been going on in American politics for quite some time, but uh, it was very pronounced there. This is not just an American phenomenon. So in Britain, if you look at the general social profile of Brexit voters, again, they tend to be working class. They tend to live outside of uh, large uh, cities uh, and you know, areas of concentrated population. In fact, the strongest correlation between who voted either for Trump or for Brexit actually is population density of the, of the area that you lived in. That was true in Britain as well as in uh, the United States. And in both countries, they tended to be older than, than uh, average vo voters. Uh, this also is a pattern internationally. So in general, more educated voters have not been particularly favorable to any of that list of populist nationalists that I uh, just mentioned. So for example, in Russia, uh, Vladimir Putin is not particularly popular in either uh, St. Petersburg or Moscow. Uh, if you've been following uh, in the last couple of months, there was a whole series of anti-corruption uh, demonstrations that were particularly intense uh, in urban areas in, uh, in Russia. Uh, his base of support are people that live outside of big cities, kind of left behind people that are suffering, you know, and, and their deindustrialization has been particularly intense and going on for some time. This is true of Mr. Uh, of President Erdogan in Turkey. Uh, he's not particularly popular in Istanbul or in Ankara, but he's got a very firm base among uh, kind of the working class and, and more rural uh, uh, Muslim voters in other parts of Turkey. Viktor Orban, again, is not popular in Budapest, uh, but he is popular in the rest of the country. So I would say that there is a common sociology, a common economic sociology that explains, uh, you know, voting patterns in many countries. Again, my fellow political scientists will insert all sorts of caveats. So, for example, in France, older voters actually voted against Marine Le Pen uh, because I think a lot of them actually remember Vichy and French wartime experience, whereas young people tended to vote for her more because the French youth unemployment raised like 30 percent. So, you know, I, I think there are reasons for these exceptions and, and, and differences. But uh, there is this common, uh, there is this common economic um, uh, driver to, uh, to populism. All right, second category of explanation has to do with politics. Uh, and I think one of the big problems in many democracies is that we have trouble making decisions. Our politics does not seem to be terribly uh, effective. When I spoke here the last time about my last book, uh, I spent a lot of time on the United States. I described the US as a vetocracy, meaning rule by veto, where you've got a lot of individual groups that are very powerful and they can essentially block uh, decisions uh, by you know, the larger society, uh, including things like passing a budget every year, uh, which Congress has not been able to do under its regular order for about 20 years now. Uh, but it extends to local things like doing infrastructure projects where in our lovely state of California, every single individual in the state, all 40 million of us have a right to sue any particular infrastructure project if we don't like it for whatever reason. Uh, so it makes it very difficult to make, do this kind of collective decision making. But there are many other democracies in which uh, this has been true. Uh, in Japan, uh, they have been unable to move forward with a, um, uh, with a reform agenda. 
uh, since the 1990s in, in, a, in a really decisive way. India has got this problem in spades. Uh, so does Italy. In all of these countries, it is very difficult to get legislative majorities behind uh, high value but controversial projects uh, in, order to, uh, in order to get them done. And so I think that this is, in a certain sense, what inspires this demand for strong leadership, that people are tired of democratic party, I mean, democratic systems uh, with squabbling parties that don't seem to be able to agree on anything, can't make difficult decisions, and therefore don't deliver on the basic public services and goods that, uh, that people want. And that's what creates this longing for, you know, a guy like Modi, who actually has done some remarkable things since he's become uh, the Prime Minister of India. He's kind of broken through all of these uh, constraints in terms of reforming the tax system uh, and so forth. And I think that if you look at the insurgencies of both Bernie Sanders and uh, you know Donald Trump, uh, there was this theme that our system has been captured by special interests, the Goldman Sachs and big banks and you know powerful lobbying groups that are preventing us from getting done the kinds of things that we need uh, we need to get done. All right. So that's the political uh, background. The final one is a cultural one, which I think uh, both economists and political scientists these days tend to uh, underestimate. Uh, I actually been thinking about this a lot because I've been, uh, actually what I'm gonna do this summer is, is finish a little book on identity and identity politics because I actually think that economics and, and, and identity have a very close um, interconnection that the politically most dangerous people in the world are not necessarily poor people uh, that are desperately you know struggling to put food on the table for their families because they oftentimes have a lot of trouble organizing politically um, they're, they're too preoccupied with simple survival the most dangerous group that has been responsible for revolutions and upsets in, in global politics tend to be people that think of themselves as middle class and then began, begin to lose that status. Uh, and that's clearly been happening to middle class groups throughout um, North America, you know, developed Asia and uh, in Europe. And this is where it gets caught up with identity because people's identity is very much connected to their, you know, their social status and the recognition that is, uh, uh, that is given to them. Uh, and the perception is uh, in this country and in Europe that uh, they've been losing ground because of immigration, because of the entry into their countries of people that are culturally different. I actually don't think this is so hard to understand because people are pretty conservative with regard to their social norms and habits. And if you see your town or village filling up with people that speak different languages that you don't understand, you're going to say, well, look, you know, something... Uh, is going on, if that's connected to job loss, where you personally feel undervalued, then that you know, lays the ground for a very, uh, you know, uh, oftentimes virulent uh, anti-immigrant sentiment. And actually, I think there are a number of political scientists that would argue that if you try to interpret the election results, either in Britain uh, for Brexit or in the United States, that you know, it, it's very, very difficult, first of all, to disentangle this identity issue from the economic issue, but that in many respects, immigration has become the single most important issue that is animating uh, the right, the mobilized right, uh, both in Europe uh, and, in, uh, and in the United States. Uh, so those are, I think, the larger uh, explanations. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? Is this going to be some kind of an in inevitable uh, trend that's going to sweep all before it the way democracy seemed to be sweeping everything before it uh, after the fall of the Berlin Wall? Well, it's, um, <laughs> uh, if you'll excuse me, I, I don't want to make a prediction because, um, as Yogi Berra said, predictions are very inherently hard to make, especially ones about the future. And... Um, <laughs> Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, I guess my own sense is that it's a little bit, I think that some of the pessimism on the part of uh, a number of observers about these global, these, you know, these same global trends that I've been uh, discussing may be, uh, in my view, a little bit uh, overdone. Uh, 
uh, in, I mean, let's just go around the world. So in Latin America, this populist trend was actually kicking into high gear 15 years ago under Hugo Chavez. It led to a total disaster in Venezuela, and it's now uh, been in retreat for the last two or three years. And so, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen in Venezuela, but nobody would look at that country as any kind of success. Argentina is now under a center-right government after uh, 10 years under the Kirchners, another uh, group of populists. Uh, other places, Ecuador, Bolivia, you know, this is a movement, I think, that is receding. And so you're actually returning to more uh, normal mainstream government that's more um, accommodating of globalization than you had previously. Asia is an interesting area because you don't have these right-wing uh, parties uh, as you do in Europe uh, or with the Trump phenomenon. Uh, it's a little bit hard to know why that's the case, but I suspect one of it has to do with the fact that most Asian countries do not permit immigration. Uh, Korea, uh, Japan, China, uh, Taiwan, none of them uh, have permitted high levels of uh, immigration from, uh, from the outside. Uh, and in fact, you know, the one where it's been happening, uh, which is a lot of the Rohingya or, or people from Bangladesh moving into uh, uh, Burma has in fact produced a pretty nasty uh, reaction on, on behalf of the, uh, the Buddhist um, uh, majority there. But by and large, the Asian democracies have, uh, um, well, this is a discussion we can have, but I actually don't think there's anything in democratic theory that says you've got an obligation to uh, have open borders or not, you know, be able to determine uh, who comes into your country. And most Asian countries simply have decided uh, that they don't want to play that game. And therefore, they've got nationalism. They've got old-fashioned nationalism in Japan, China, Korea. But it's the kind that's perfectly familiar, you know, from the 19th century, driven by leaders, driven by national interest uh, uh, and the like. Europe uh, is the really bright spot this year because you've now had elections in the Netherlands and uh, the recent one last month in France where uh, the threat from people like Heert Wilders or Marine Le Pen has been beaten back. I would say that's not, we shouldn't you know, take too much comfort from that because there's still you know, an important major uh, minority of voters that are very unhappy that have been suffering from the same kinds of economic and political, you know, problems, uh, as in um, Britain and the US. Uh, but um, for the time being, the support for the European institution and for more uh, orthodox um, economic policies remains relatively secure. I think the German election later this year is not going to yield any surprises. Angela Merkel uh, will stay in power and the like. Uh, so finally, we get to the United States. Um, I actually think that if you look I mean, so we've been having this kind of debate among political scientists as to the strength of American institutions because as, so as a citizen, I have one set of opinions. As a political scientist, I think we're undergoing this really fascinating exper uh, experiment right now, sort of natural experiment about the strength of institutions because the American founding fathers created this complex system of checks and balances, I think precisely, you know, in a, in a way to, to meet a situation like that. You know, they, they read a lot of Roman history. They understood the dangers of a highly ambitious uh, person like Julius Caesar, and they created the system of widely shared powers to prevent that person from dominating the entire system. Uh, I complained about this the last time I spoke to you because it also prevents the system from doing stuff. Uh, but Americans have made the, the long-term choice that they would rather not get stuff done in good periods uh, if they can avoid getting really bad stuff done to them uh, in, in other periods. And I think, you know, that's the test that we're undergoing now. And actually, if I had to predict, you know, what's the future of this current administration, they're going to go down as another weak and ineffective uh, government because they actually couldn't get legislative majorities. They couldn't, you know, muster enough support to actually uh, carry out large parts of uh, their agenda. Uh, so, you know, I, I think things are working as the Founding Fathers um, uh, designed them. I think that the longer-term threats are a little bit 
different and they're more in the realm of ideas than in the realm of uh, actual you know, policies that may be enacted or not over the next few years. There's been this shift in, in thinking on the right that I think is actually very disturbing. If you go back to the days of Ronald Reagan, Ronald Reagan was a classic liberal in the 19th century sense that he believed in freedom. He believed that governments are meant to protect individual freedom and that we should maximize that, you know, that individual freedom. Uh, and he was actually a liberal furthermore in the sense of believing in openness both in free trade, uh, he was in favor of immigration. He said it had to be legal, but it was basically you know, a source of strength uh, for the United States. And I think that his definition of what it meant to be an American and of American nat uh, national identity was one that was very widely, sh it wasn't always the case that people believed this, but it, it was one that emerged in the 20th century after the big wave of immigration uh, at the beginning of the 20th century that said American identity is not based on religion, it's not based on ethnicity, it's not based on race, it is based on belief in a shared set of democratic principles, the Constitution of the United States, the rule of law, uh, democratic sovereignty. If you believe in all of those principles, then you're an American. Uh, you're an American uh, simply as a result of that uh, political set of beliefs and, you know, in a, in a sense, None of the other characteristics like your race and your religion and other things you can't do very much about, none of that other stuff should matter very much. And I think that what we're seeing uh, emerge is a shift away from that you know, fundamentally liberal understanding of American identity. And again, not liberal in the liberal conservative sense, but classic liberal that I believe Ronald Reagan shared uh, to one that is more based on, um, you know, things like, like ethnicity and religion. I mean, and that, I think, in a modern de facto multicultural society is really not a, uh, you know, that's not a, that's not a uh, formula for success. There is an interesting uh, debate that took place in the last couple of weeks in the National Review and other places on the right where the, the National Review is actually taking the more liberal position, but the question was, do you love the United States because of its values and what it stands for, or would you love the United States regardless? Even if those values change, you'd still love it because this is where you're born, this is where your family is, this is where all your experiences are. And I think that's kind of the crux of, of the issue that we're facing, because the old definition would have certainly taken the first position that we love the United States because it's the home of liberty, of Republican self-government, uh, you know, of the people, by the people, for the people, uh, and not because we come from a particular tribe or, you know, believe in a certain religion. Uh, and that debate is ongoing, and I don't think it's been settled, and I don't think it'll really be settled by anything that's likely to happen in our day-to-day -day politics uh, in the next uh, uh, coming weeks and months. So, thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions or comments.